sometimes when you're taking a trip, I don't know how it is with your kids, but when our kids were younger and we'd take this trip, you'd barely get started and you'd head down the road and all of a sudden you'd hear from the back seat something like this, Dad, are we there yet? And of course the answer was no. Well, what do you do after that and especially after the hundredth time in the first 10 miles? Are we there yet? No. Well, we didn't have the privilege that some of you young parents have this day. When they, when they ask those kinds of questions over a period of time, I know what you guys do. You just put another DVD in. <laughs> we didn't have that. So we had to figure out some way to keep those kids going and engaged. And so one of the things that we would do, one of the things that seemed to work at least for a little while, is begin to talk to them about where they were going and begin to describe what we were going to do when we get there and what it was going to be like when they got there as well. And as we did that, that would work for a little while. But as we get older, you may begin to wonder if some of the stories you've been told about the destination that you're taking, you may wonder if it really is going to be what they say it's going to be, what it's cracked up to be. And some of you have lived long enough to know that some of the resorts and the places where you went, where you planned and you thought and you heard, had recommendations, you got there and it wasn't exactly what it was cracked up to be at all. And you have had to adjust to that in your life. And so you begin, and I got to thinking about this. We can begin to do this in our spiritual lives where we begin to think about the fact that when we talk about the future and being with Christ and being in heaven and being in eternity, that what we have heard, we almost become jaded because the world gives and grabs our attention and we forget about the destination. And even if we hear about it, it's like, can it really be that good? Is it really going to be that different? Maybe you're like um, my Aunt Margaret. Uh, it's good to have my parents with us today, all the way from Louisiana. And uh, Dad tells the story. I, I don't know. He, he may correct me before this is all over. Uh, but he tells the story of my Aunt Margaret. Now, my Aunt Margaret, as I recall her as a child, was rather a kind of a no-nonsense, serious kind of woman. I mean, that's how I experienced her. So the story is told that they were on their way to um, the, the Rocky Mountains and Colorado Springs where I was born. And they were headed up into the mountains. And, and Aunt Margaret uh, was, got thirsty. She, she wanted to stop. She needed a drink. And she got really thirsty. And uh, my dad began to say to her, no, he said, you ought to wait until we get to just at the, 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 the foothills at Manitou Springs. There's a, there, there's a place there where you, you can get the biggest, freshest drink of mountain stream water. It's cold. It's crystal clear. It's just the greatest stuff. You want to wait till, till then. Now, my Aunt Margaret was also kind of like my English uh, grandmother, her mother, and she could be kind of gullible sometimes as well. And especially if she begins to believe her younger brother. And so as they made their way to Manitou Springs, and as they went, she, she got increasingly thirsty, but they kept telling her, if you just get to this crystal clear spring water, it will be the best taste in water you've ever had in your life. And so she waited, and, and, and she go thirstier and thirstier, and she was anticipating, and she could hardly wait till they get there. And finally, they made it up, as the story goes, to Manitou Springs, and they stopped, and, and, and she began Again, as she got out of the car, she could hardly wait. She had her cup ready, and she, she bypassed the, the huge red Indian who was kneeling with the, the clay jar where the water was pumped through and would come out. She didn't even take time to do that. She wanted to go down around back of the building to the crystal clear stream, the stream itself that was flowing and bubbling and, and the sound of the water, and she was just 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 thirsty, waiting for the moment to get, get that moment when she could taste that water and she got back down there to the stream and she dipped her her cup in there and she pulled that up and and she brought it to her parched lips and and took a great big gulp of that crystal clear cool beautiful water now we didn't have smartphones back then but I wish they could have had the videotape running. 
as she took up a great big old gulp of that water, all of a sudden, the, 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 the distorted look on her face, and she coughed, and, and, and she spat, and she kept on spitting, and she, she began to scream and shriek. Because you see, the, the water she had been promised was carbonated mineral mountain water that tastes absolutely disgusting if you're not ready for it. And she was totally caught off guard. And I don't know, she threw the water on somebody and she was absolutely furious that somebody had promised her this drink of water and it didn't turn out to be what it had been advertised to her. I don't know if you can relate, but I can relate to some things like that in my life and the road trips that you're on with great anticipations and the pictures that sometimes can be deceiving in your lives. And that's the issue with the road trip of life, isn't it? And it's the way where sometimes we all live. And it was true for the Apostle John and it was true for the early Christians in the early church. They were living on a road trip. They didn't have church buildings to meet in. Their properties had been confiscated by the government in many cases. They were nomads. They were living under the pressure of losing their jobs. They were living in difficult times in their lives. And they weren't sure what the future would hold. And they were living in this crazy, crazy world. In fact, the Apostle John himself was separated from his congregation. He could not even meet with the churches that he pastored. Because he had been, he had been arrested by the government and sent to a hard labor camp on the island of Patmos and it was there that he was working separated from his church family and he had no way to communicate with them except they would let him write a letter but he had to be careful how he wrote the letter because if he wrote it too plainly the, the government would confiscate the letter and would never make it to the churches and so he almost had to use an Old Testament Bible code to write the letter and we have that record of that letter in the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation is, is kind of a code letter for believers. You have to know something about the Old Testament to understand it. But John was sending this letter to his church family. And he was saying to them, don't give up. Don't quit. You may not know where you're going. You may not know what's going to happen next. But there is an end. There is a destination. And there is a God who is in control. And that becomes the message that he gives. So on one Sunday morning, the Bible says... On one Sunday morning, John found a place of worship from his hard labor on this isolated island called Patmos. And he, and he wrote the beginning of this letter, beginning in Revelation 1. I want you to see this, and then we're going to go to where he describes it in chapter 21. He said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches. And then so the believers would understand it, he begins to describe the very presence of Jesus. Look at verse 12. When I turned to see who was speaking to me, I saw someone like the Son of Man. He's describing Jesus. He's wearing a long robe with gold sash around his chest. His head and his hair was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like polished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. And his face was like the sun in all of its brilliance. And when John saw him, he said, I fell as if at his feet as if I were dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the living one. I died. But look, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and the grave. Write down what you have seen, both the things that are now happening and the things that will happen happen the scripture says that no eye has seen nor has it even entered into the minds or the imagination what God has conceived and prepared for those who love him and who love his appearing and so here is on the one hand we cannot comprehend or fully imagine all that God has for us in the future 
And yet, on the other hand, God gives us a glimpse. He gives us a snapshot. He gives us a moment where we see some, some semblance of what we're going to experience and where we are going on this journey. And I want us to look at Revelation this morning in chapter 21 where he begins to describe what heaven is like. It's the answer to the question, are we there yet? And the answer is no. But let me tell you, John says, what it's going to be like when we get there so that you can make the journey and you can take the road trip and you won't get detoured and distracted and get off the track but you will stay on the track to the destination and God's word tells us what heaven is going to be like let me give you a couple of things that that God's going to give to us when we get to heaven number one in chapter 21 heaven is a real place now we need to say that this morning because we're living in a culture In which there are some people who think that heaven is some kind of a mind game. They think it's some kind of a state of mind or a non-physical realm. That somewhere you're going to go into this ethereal, undefined existence. That's not at all what John says. Look at at chapter 21, verse 1. Heaven, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth have passed away and there is no longer any sea. So the first thing he tells us is, is that heaven and earth are no longer going to be separated. They're going to be together in a seamless existence. He says, I saw the holy city Jerusalem coming down to earth. And God will be with his people. And he says here that the sea, there will be no more sea. Well, what does that mean? Well, that's kind of strange to us. But when you understand in Jesus' day, the sea, the water, the ocean was a very chaotic, evil kind of place to be. The people lived in fear of the sea. It was always chaotic. It was the representation of demonic activity. It was the place where storms took place. It was the place where there was uncontrollable destructive weather in their lives. And so when John comes along and says to this people, there I saw there was no more sea. What he's saying is there's going to be a place called heaven where there's no more demonic activity, no more evil, no more chaos, no more destructive weather patterns, no more global warming, whatever you, you want to think about the, the weather patterns and all that takes place. He said it's not going to happen anymore, that there will be a place in which heaven and earth are brand new. And Jesus said it this way. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, there you can be also in in your life so heaven is a place where Jesus is and John says this new heaven and this this new earth are going to flow out of an old earth and an old heaven that is totally remade in fact Peter said it this way there's there's going to come a time in which the earth as we know it is going to burn up with fervent heat God's going to just cleanse it with fire and remake it. And he's going to make the new heavens and the earth come together. And we will experience all of that. John said, I saw this holy city coming down like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And what that tells us what we've been singing about this morning. That that, that heaven is going to be a place in which we will experience without break. The love of God and the depth of the love of God. It'll be like the love between a bridegroom and a bride. It it will be the, the, the deep love that God has for us will be fully experienced. And then verse 16 tells us that heaven will be an open, spacious place that will allow us plenty of room. Look at, look at what it says here in verse 16. This city will be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high as it is long. Well, what does that mean? We're not talking stadia. That's about 1,400 square miles is what's described here. It is the space from Mexico to Canada and from the Appalachians to California. It will accommodate 
all of us is the, is the meaning of that passage. And it fulfills what Jesus said when he said to his disciples when he was getting ready to go to the cross. And they were in such depression and they didn't know what was going to happen next. And he was talking about leaving them and they were, they were upset about the whole process. He said to them, in my father's house, there are many dwelling places. There's plenty of room. In my father's house, there will be plenty of room for us, a new heaven and a new earth. The second thing that John writes to the church is, he said, while you're on this road trip, I want you to know that heaven will be the real presence of God himself. Look at verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men And he's going to live with them. And they will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. I doubt that there is a week that goes by. But what I hear from someone or even from myself or the feelings that come where you feel like you want to ask the question, where is God? You ever experienced that? You wonder about his absence. Why is God? There's been some things that happened in your life this week, and you're going, where's God? Why did he let that happen? Have you experienced the God who seems to be sometimes silent and far away? He seems to be silent and absent. You beg for him to speak. He's silent. You want to draw close to him, but it seems like your prayers just just like hit a brass ceiling and you can't get close. And even though the scripture says draw nigh to him, it takes a while for you to feel like he really draws nigh to you. And that's because there's this, this physical limitations that we live in. And John understood that. And he was talking to this persecuted people. And though we can cultivate the presence of God like we have this morning in worship. Sometimes it's hard to discern it. Sometimes it's confusing in our lives. And sometimes it's difficult to know why he does that. The good news is, John says, there's coming a day in the destination where we're going where you will no longer wonder where God is or where he, he, what he's saying because his presence will be immediate and continuous And real. We can't even hardly imagine that can we? That that we will live in his presence. And notice what he says here. In his presence. The heaven and the earth. When they come together. His will will be done. We've been praying that in the Lord's prayer a long time haven't we? Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth. As it is in heaven. This is the answer to that Lord's Prayer we've been praying all of our lives. John says it'll come together. And, and so what it means to every wounded wife who's been abandoned by her husband, to every shy child who's been bullied and teased about their pimples or their weight, and to every person who has suffered in some way in their brokenness, the greatest comfort comes that we will experience the full and continuous presence of God. And look at verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. You cried any tears this week for what's going on in your life? There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things is passed away. Look at verse 5. God says, I will make everything new. No more sin, no more divorce, no more crying, no more crime, no more sickness, no more death. I was thinking about that the other day. Do you realize how many people will be out of a job the exterminators what are they going to do the counselors they'll have to change the mode of counseling or at least the subjects they counsel on i I was thinking about insurance adjusters they'll have to change jobs I, i was thinking about mechanics nothing will ever break down i was thinking about policemen and health care providers Think about all of that. You say, well, what are they going to do? God will have a plenty for them to do. He's going to put us to work. And the scripture says that one of these days, his presence will be full, continuous, immediate, and real. He will not be absent, and he will no longer be silent. Number three, heaven is a place of real wealth. 
John describes heaven as a spectacular place. He describes the beauty of heaven as having walls and gates of precious gemstones and jewels. And he goes into great detail if you, if you read that this morning. And, and gates of pearls, streets of pure gold. But then he says what really is going to shine is not the gold and the jewels and the silver. It's going to be the radiant presence of God himself. And it raises the question for all of us this morning. What do you really value? What are you holding on to in this life? What do you really put the value in? You see, see, when you think about it on this earth, we take minerals out of the earth and, and we take jewels and we take gold and silver and, and we hire security companies to protect it. We put it in locked showcases and alarm it. <laughs> We do everything we can to, to, to bring that, to, to put those valuables in elaborate security systems and to protect that kind of mineral and jewelry. In fact, when you read the history, the greatest robbery and greatest heists throughout history have been, been centered around getting their hands on some rare jewel or some kind of precious stone or, or mineral. And here John says that heaven's going to be a whole lot different. Values will drastically change, kind of like when we have had the privilege in the last few years to, to go to Europe to visit uh, Martin and Chesey. It's an interesting thing. The, the thinking begins to have to change when you get ready to cross the big pond and you enter into a new country where there's new currency. And one of the things that we have always had to work with Martin on is that you're going to exchange the American dollar for the euro or the Swiss franc. And, and so one of the things is we're getting close to the trip. He has to constantly be monitoring the, the, the different exchange values between those currencies to try to get it so that we get the best bang for our buck in the other side. And sometimes the best we could do, we lost value on the other side. We lost buying power by changing the American dollar to euro or Swiss francs. And we had to, we, we had to, to live in, in an environment where we couldn't buy as much. And then when you begin to make the plans to come back across, we spend that money like crazy. Why? Because we're going to lose on the exchange rate. You just as well spend it, bring something home that you can eat or do something with and, you, and have some value. And so we, we understand that when we get ready to return, we start spending that. Well, heaven will be something like that. Have you thought about this? What we value most on this old earth is going to become common street pavement in the heavenlies. It's going to become building material. The value of what you are now protecting is fading away. It's worthless. Now, I know we have a lot of things we'd like to experience. So do I. Some of you have said, you know, it'd be really cool if we could, if I, we, we could own that vehicle and just drive it for a while. If we could just go on that yacht trip. If we could just have that exotic experience. Or if we could just do this. Or we could win the lottery and do something else with that. And some of us have, have you ever had the thought? I had the thought. I, I was thinking about it the other day. You know what? If, if, if we weren't committed to tithing our income and, and, and giving sacrificially to forward in faith, I began to just list all the things I could do. I could do a lot of things. And you see, in the value systems of this world, we're tempted to move in that direction. But then when you think about the sacrificial giving in our lives, that ultimately, when we get to heaven, it's worthless. In terms of the value of what we hold on to. I'm reminded of the old story of the old rancher. Who invited the preacher out to his house. And as he, as he got there he got out. He said I want you to get in my lariat pickup. And uh, we're going to take a tour. I want you to show you. I want you to see what, what, what I have. So he took him up on a bluff several miles away. And they got out of the truck. And the old rancher turned to the preacher. And, and he said you see, you see over there to the east as far as you can see in the horizon you, you can barely see it that clear over there acres and acres and miles and miles see all of that I own everything from here to there 
And then he turned in the other direction and he said to the preacher, you see over there to the west, you know, the, there's just a little dot to, on the horizon over there. It's, a, it's an old, big old oak tree, but it's just barely visible. You see all of that? All the way from here to there, I own all of that. And then he turned to the north and he said, no, I want you to look in that direction. See that bluff out there? Way out there. It just looks like, looks like a little bump in the, in the ground. I want you to look out there all the way from here to there. Own all that too. And then he looked to the south and he said, I want you to see that. Uh, there's a fence over there. You can't even see it. It's so far away. Miles and miles. He said, I own all of that in every direction that you can see. It's, it's all mine. The preacher stood there and admired all of, the, all of the things that God had blessed him with. And then he turned to the old rancher and he said, but I have one question for you. I get it that you own this and that direction and that and that direction and all of that and that direction and all of this and that direction. But I have a question for you. How much do you own in this direction? And the rancher grew quiet and bowed his head. His focus was here. The question for all of us this morning is, how much you got invested in this direction in your life? What are you saving for? Who are you leaving your wealth to? What are you leaving it for? How much investment are you making in a future home in heaven? And, and what begins to happen with all of the things that become cheap and worthless? Stories told of Charles E. Fuller who was a great preacher of the past, and he announced one Sunday that the next Sunday he would preach on heaven. Well, there was a beautiful letter that he received from an elderly gentleman who was on his sickbed, and he wrote him a letter, and he said to Dr. Fuller, next Sunday, you're going to talk about heaven. He said, I'm interested in that land because I've held a clear title to a bit of that property for over 55 years. I didn't buy it. It was given to me without money and without price. But the donor purchased it for me at a tremendous sacrifice. I'm not holding it for speculation since the title's not transferable. It's not a vacant lot. For more than half a century, I've been sending materials out of which the greatest architect and builder of the universe has been building a home for me, which will never need to be remodeled or repaired because it'll suit me perfectly, individually, and it'll never grow old. Termites can't undermine its foundations, for they rest on the rock of ages. Fire will not be able to destroy it. Floods cannot wash it away. No locks or bolts will ever be placed on its doors. No vicious person will ever enter that land where my dwelling stands. It's now almost completed and it's ready for me to enter in and abide in peace eternally without fear of ever being rejected. I hope to hear your sermon on heaven next Sunday from my home in Los Angeles, but I have no assurance that I shall be able to do so. And then he wrote, my ticket to heaven has no date. It's marked for the journey, no return coupon and no permit for baggage. Yes, I'm ready to go and I may not be here when you're talking next Sunday, but I'll meet you there someday. Heaven has real wealth that lasts in value. Heaven is full of provision, number four. Heaven, heaven will be a satisfying place. Notice the abundant provisions, chapter 22, verse 1 and 2. The angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. And on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. Not only will heaven have no loss, it will have no lack. What a contrast. I was just reading the other day, 800 million people will go to sleep tonight hungry. One in six people in the world live in extreme poverty under a dollar a day. The average salary of the top 20 hedge managers is 22,000 times the salary of an average worker. But in heaven, nobody will lack. There will be fullness. There will be full provision. You will have what you need and all will be satisfied and made available to you. And the last thing this morning is, is probably the most important thing in terms of being ready for that moment. Heaven is a place of real purity. It's a select place. Not everybody 
who talks about heaven is going there. Let me say that again. Not everybody who talks about heaven is going there. In fact, you can go to the bars this weekend. You go into the bar and you'll hear all kinds of talk about heaven and St. Peter jokes and all kinds of jokes in your civic clubs about St. Peter and all the things that are going to take supposedly take place in heaven. But the Bible says heaven is a select place. As I preparing this sermon, I came across a joke I thought about using and I decided not to use it because it, it was about a man, an elderly gentleman who got to heaven and had a stomping fit over what he found. And I thought, that's not what's going to happen. Here's what the Bible says. The cowards, the unbelievers, the corrupt, the murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, all liars, and their fate is in the fiery lake of the burning sulfur. And the practice of witchcraft in the Greek language also is the word from which we get the word pharmaceutical. The misuse of drugs was involved in the ancient world with witchcraft. They'll not be there. The fate, the very lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Look at verse 27. It says, nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those names whose, who are written in the Lamb's book of life. It's pure place. And only those who have come to Christ and had their sins forgiven and allowed Him to purify their hearts by faith will be there. Their identity with the Christ, the Lamb. The Bible says that God has put eternity in our hearts. And I love what A.W. Tozer said here. He said, let no one apologize for the powerful emphasis of Christianity lays upon the doctrine of the world to come. Right there lies an immense superiority to everything else within the whole sphere of human thought or experience. We would do well to think. Often about the long tomorrow. Dr. Criswell, pastor of the First Baptist Church some years ago, was on an airplane flying when he ran into a rather well-known theologian. He began a conversation with that theologian, and as they, as they talked together, he learned that the theologian had just lost his son in death. Little, little boy. And so he began to tell the story about uh, the loss of his son. He said it started out that he would come home and he would have a fever and we would take him to the doctor and they would try to treat him. And, and we just thought it was one of those childhood things. But we learned soon enough that it was a, a very aggressive form of meningitis. He said the, the day came when the doctor simply said to us, we cannot save your little boy. He's going to die. He so said, we brought him home and we began to nurse him. But the day came when the vision and, and the brain began to get clouded. And, and, and one night toward the evening, he said to his daddy, Daddy, it's getting very, very, very dark now, isn't it? And his daddy said, yes. It's getting very, very dark. And it was very dark for him as well. In a little while, the little boy turned to his daddy and he said, Daddy, it's time for me to go to sleep, isn't it? And his daddy said, yeah, it's about time for you to go to sleep. He said, the, the professor said, no, the boy had a, he said, my son had a, some little ritual he kind of did. He, he kind of had a way of taking his pillow and he'd, he'd shape it and puff it up a little bit and he'd lay it a certain way and then he said he would always put his hands under his head as he lay down. And he would, he would go to sleep with his hands and his head like this on the pillow that he had arranged just right. And the little boy put the pillow in place and arranged it just right. And he put his, he put his hands underneath his head. And he laid down. As he closed the eye, his eyes, he said, Daddy, good night. 
I'll see you in the morning. And he closed his eyes in death and moved into the realm of the heavenlies. Dr. Criswell said that after he told that story, he said he looked out the plane window for a long, long time and went silent. He said when he turned back, he said hot, scalding tears were coming out of his eyes. And he turned to Dr. Criswell. And here's what he said. He said, and I can, I can't hardly wait till it's morning. Why? Because he has an investment on the other side. And I want to ask you this morning. Are you ready? See, you may be asking the question, are we there yet? (laughs) The question that God would have us to ask this morning is, are you ready for the morning? Ready for home? Ready for heaven? The real place, a place with immediate, continuous presence of God. A place of real wealth, a, a place of full provision and real purity. And you see, if you can get a glimpse on that and get a snapshot on that and take a look at that every once in a while and keep that in focus in your life, it'll change the way you live. It will change the way you see the world. It will change the way you see other people. It will change the way that you you travel on this road trip. You say, how do I do that? Well, you have an invitation to this road trip and to this destination. Jesus said, if you would confess your sins and... And ask him to forgive you. He is faithful and just to forgive you your sins. But not just stop there. He has through his blood the power to cleanse you and purify you from all sin. He can set you free of your addictions. He can give you a hope that gets brighter and brighter to a perfect day. He can give you strength as you're on the road trip. And when it gets tough on the road trip and you're not sure where we're going and you're not sure how long it's going to take, you'll have a glimpse of where we're going because he's given it to us. And as we move into his presence, as many as believed on his name, to them gave he the right to become a part of the family of God and to ensure a place and a destination in the heavenlies. I ask you this morning, are you ready? You're taking the trip. Why not get ready for the heavenlies, for the morning that is to come?